Life is magic. Food sustains life. Therefore, food is a kind of magic. This was how Old Blue started his explanation, as he and Lefty sat in the same stone room they had camped in, enjoying a breakfast of enchanted bread high up on the twelfth floor of the food tabernacle. The wise old kicken took a single bite, closed his eyes briefly to savor its supernatural flavor, before launching into a more in-depth explanation. Your mundane, everyday meals may not seem magical, but that's only because you're used to them. You've eaten every day since you were born, so you never realize just how miraculous it actually is. When you stop to think about it, though, you realize that food, even basic food, is power. It's pure energy that you absorb into your body just by chewing it up and swallowing it. If that's not magical, I don't know what is. And keep in mind that most of the energy you get from food derives from the act of cooking it, not from the ingredients themselves. Take common bread as an example. It's made mostly from grain, flour, and yeast, things you certainly could eat individually, though I wouldn't recommend it. In addition to tasting absolutely terrible, these things on their own bestow so little energy that it's scarcely worth consuming them. Take those same nearly useless ingredients, though, and bake them together in just the right way, and suddenly you have bread, a life-sustaining food hundreds of times more powerful than its individual parts. Even the most simple of recipes, like baking bread or cooking meat, can turn something distasteful and weak into something delicious and powerful. And that's just the most basic level of food magic. With careful application of mathematics and artistry, a talented chef can multiply the effectiveness of food even further, creating meals that don't just sustain life, but enhance it to supernatural levels. You've already seen some of that at work with this enchanted bread. It's been cooked in such a way that it alone can restore your energy as if it were a full feast of normal food. Quite amazing for mediocre work done by amateurs. Now an actual chef, they could create bread so amazing it would keep you well fed for weeks. And that's just bread. Given a full range of ingredients and the proper tools to work with, a true food meister could make meals capable of curing diseases, increasing the eater's fortitude, and even healing from mortal wounds. Neat, said Lefty taking another bite of the delicious bread. Old Blue continued speaking. As for the food tabernacle, I'm actually kind of surprised you were never told about it. I would have thought that all of At would be aware of it. It's actually just one of nine such tabernacles, built long ago by the mad King Scavolus. They were supposed to have been grand monuments, built not only to celebrate the natural elements, but also Scavolus's triumph over the forces of evil. Unbeknownst to most, though, the tabernacles had a second, secret purpose. Inside each one, the king had placed one of nine clavis imperium. A clavis imperium? asked Lefty, his mouth stuffed full of bread. Aye, said Old Blue, taking a moment to decode what Lefty had been trying to say. The Clavis Imperium, the keys of power, he reiterated, before taking a deep breath and continuing with his explanation. Created by Scavolus near the end of his reign, they were part of a crazed plan to find a suitable heir. Each key was placed inside a tabernacle, and each tabernacle was, in fact, host to some deadly challenge meant to test those who entered them. Whoever is brave enough, strong enough, and cunning enough to conquer all nine tabernacles and gain possession of the Clavis Imperium will prove themselves worthy to claim all the wealth of the kingdom for themselves. Literally. For you see, in the height of his power, Scavolus enacted a rather radical plan, a standard centralized economy based on paper money. It was not a simple plan, but 
It was actually a very popular reform among the poor majority at the time. He promised that it would not only make commerce easier for all, but that it would help end the tyranny of certain aristocratic factions. Of course, to ensure that everyone used the kingdom's new monetary standard, the old standard had to be removed. And so, every piece of valuable metal in the kingdom, every ounce of gold, every last rare gem in existence, was seized by Scaevolus and the royal army, either purchased from those who would give it up willingly, or taken by force from those who would not. To his credit, Scaevolus's plan did indeed accomplish everything he said it would. The majority of citizens are much better off now than they were before his reforms, and if it wasn't for what he revealed afterwards, it might have been remembered as a great act by a noble king. But of course it wasn't, not entirely anyway. It was only after all the treasure of the kingdom had been secured, and the construction of the tabernacles had been completed, that Scaevolus revealed the full extent of his mad scheme. Initially, Scaevolus had promised that the kingdom's wealth would be safely stored away in the royal vaults, and that it would serve as the foundation for his new paper currency. But that was a lie. Instead, every bit of old wealth had been hidden away in a secret tenth tabernacle, the cash tabernacle, which could only be located and unlocked by collecting the keys he had hidden in the other nine tabernacles. Rather than simply name an heir like a traditional monarch, Scaevolus stated that anyone mighty enough to overcome the tabernacles would be worthy to claim his throne, and that that claim would be reinforced by a complete control over the nation's wealth. Scaevolus may have been mad with power, but he wasn't stupid. The Nine Keys aren't merely some ceremonial trinkets that bestow power because the monarch says they do. They are actual, tangible keys that unlock a treasure which has value beyond measure. Literally, all the gold in the kingdom was locked away in some hidden place, and whoever could find it and control it would control the kingdom. This plan, this ridiculous, convoluted scheme, is why he's known as Scaevolus the Mad, and not Scaevolus the Great. Huh, said Lefty, showing a distinct lack of exuberance for the story. So who ended up getting all the keys? He asked casually as he finished off the last of his breakfast. Old Blue just stared at Lefty in disbelief. What do you mean, lad? Do you really know nothing about your homeland? Nothing about history at all? to which Lefty only shrugged. He knew there was a king. He had been told all his life that he had a king, that he should be loyal to said king, because he might one day call upon Lefty to defend his country. But that was all he knew. Like the rest of the outside world, the king seemed distant and foreign to him, just another far-off ideal that he had never put any actual thought into. No one said Old Blue, after a moment. No one has ever claimed even a single key. Many have tried, but the danger of the tabernacles has proven far too difficult for anyone to actually surmount. What? said Lefty, finally emoting, surprised that a story from so long ago could actually still be relevant. But this place, it's, it's all torn up. All those people came through here and none of them got the key? he asked inquisitively. Old Blue opened his mouth and was about to answer, but Lefty added on, And hey, wait, if no one got the keys, then who's the king? Old Blue waited a moment, patiently making sure that Lefty was actually done speaking before he finally responded. There is no king. No real king, at least. There hasn't been one for years now. Ever since Scaevolus was taken out of commission, the kingdom has largely been run by the Senate and the Guilds. And as for the food tabernacle, while it's true that the main floors have long since been picked clean by adventurers and chefs alike, the Clavis Imperium is up on the top floor, guarded by a deadly beast which has claimed the lives of everyone unfortunate enough to confront it. 
Lefty sat in silence, taking a moment to process everything he had just learned. Then, having a sudden realization, he looked away from his new companion and over at his trusty shovel, which was leaning up against the wall where he had left it last night. The young man remembered fondly how he had used it to defeat the chefs outside, and how he had thoroughly enjoyed the violence of the fight. And as he did so, his eyes began to light up. So wait, he said after a short pause, his thoughts beginning to form into a coherent idea. You're telling me there's a super valuable thing here, and I can get it by fighting something? He asked as he grabbed his shovel, holding it tightly in his hands as he looked back at Old Blue with fiery passion burning in his eyes. The aimless young man had finally found a task worth getting excited about. The tired old kick inside and stared up at Lefty with a grim look on his feline face. He deeply regrets having explained anything. 